much does food affect brain function? I mean, this is more my own personal religion, but I think it's a big deal. I am a big believer everybody should get a lot of protein. I eat a lot of fish. I want to minimize my aging and maximize my brain health. So I don't really take fish oils. I try to, but my breath smelled like fish oil and it kind of made me nauseated, but I just eat a lot of fish. Um, I eat a lot of protein. Sometimes I don't eat fish, but I think, I think protein is, gets, gets, um, doesn't get emphasized enough. Um, I think like glucose spikes in general aren't great for your body or brain. Uh, I know people go really extreme. Somebody asked me in Red Edit. I didn't answer that question. Maybe I could just find that and answer that question. But somebody asked about uh, keto. Uh, keto is a little severe for me. I've I've tried that. Oh yeah, here it is. Regarding diet and performance keto. Um, I've tried keto. I'm going to say this as I answer you guys. Um, but it's a little severe for me. So the idea with ketoacidosis is you, you completely get off glucose metabolism and your, and your metabolism and uh, acetones, ketones. Um, and, um, and it's more like, uh, it's kind of like, it's kind of like if you try to run, a, I, I shouldn't use car metaphors, I don't understand that well, but it's like, it's like, you know, like nitro or jet fuel, you know, burns hotter and you're kind of like wrecking your car by using it all the time instead of regular gasoline. That's like glucose, you know? It's like, like you gotta get used to a slower steady burn with like regular gas, otherwise your car is not gonna last that long. So, um, I mean, your body tries to compensate. I mean, that's why insulin exists. It tries to basically uh, signal every cell in your body to suck up that sugar in your blood um, as fast as possible and then start to store it later. So it tries to regulate it. And if you have a normal endocrine system, I think that it's works more or less, but I think, I don't know. I think I think not taxing this, I think not having your, your brain in particular experience these high spikes of uh, glucose levels and then crash. Um, uh, I mean, ketosis is like a really, it's a very stable, but it's more severe because I mean, any level of carb or sugar consumption um, kind of flips you back out of ketosis. Um, so I don't know. You can look up gluconeogenesis and all those pathways I don't really remember anymore, but uh, let me make a little comment on this guy and then I'll get to the next question. Uh, diet and performance. Specifically, does research show benefits to fasting? Uh, I never <laughs> did research on fasting myself or um, in academics. Uh, I like fish and a lot of protein in general and tea. I drink a lot of tea. Um, Just my personal preference. And vegetables, because it helps you digest slower and there's some carbs in there, but it's slow digestion. Whatever, I'm kind of lazy, so I kind of like trying to converge on a diet that works for me, so I don't have to, you know, work out that much or count calories. Uh, I wanna ask, does quantum dynamics have an impact on neurons or is that outside your field? It's probably outside my field, but I have an opinion on it, so. This is as good as form as any. Um, that's what's cool about this, by the way. It's, I mean, it's not that stuffy academics or, I don't know. Um, yeah, I th my belief is, uh, because I, so I, I, I follow this stuff sometimes. Like there's a lot of, um, I don't know what to call them, consciousness philosophers. I think uh, you might be referring to, and then they they, they try to find evidence that our consciousness is dependent on these phenomena we see in quantum physics. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't. My, my answer is no. 
Um, there was a guy I know at University of Arizona that specifically thought that the, um, if I recall, the microtubules in cells. So if you remember, I don't know if you remember from cell bio, every cell like actually has like a skeleton. It's these microtubules and there are these proteins that are like, um, I forget what those candies are called. They're like long things that are hollow. Anyway, his, his uh, argument was that the distance inside of that was just a like, small enough distance that quantum effects could happen. And somehow because these microtubules are in all your cells, particularly your neurons, I mean, they're not in particular your neurons, but he was saying because they're in your neurons, even though they're in all your cells, the cytoskeleton, which could conduct quantum effects would be like the basis of consciousness. The problem is there's no like great evidence for that. Like our consciousness is like, it's not well described by anything, but it's much, much, much better described by neural activity, like the gross electric neural activity. And if you affect that neural activity, you see clear correlations with observable states of consciousness with people. So, you know, I mean, I don't see, if somebody creates a tool in the next hundred years to measure quantum effects of microtubules and we see better correlations and that's actually causing all the effects in neurons or something, like, that'd be cool. But um, I'm deeply skeptical. Um, and that's, it's not because I'm a square. Um, I actually did a minor, my, one of my minors in um, college was in physics. So I took honors quantum physics and stuff like that. And, um, Physics is actually my favorite topic in, in high school, but I didn't, I didn't do that. Anyway, um, does it have an impact on your neurons? Um, or is it outside your field? There's so many meanings to that. <laughs> it's outside your quantum field of consciousness, your electric field. Um, yeah, no, I know because there, I, there's this guy at Irvine that really ticks me off who talks about um, what's his name? It doesn't matter. But he talks about like applying quantum phenomena more macroscopically. And the problem with quantum phenomena is it works in the context of really small things. Like as soon as you start observing stuff that are bigger, we, quantum phenomena don't really apply. We have different sets of rules to describe that. Just like if you go big enough and you talk about like black holes or stars, we have general relativity to describe that. We don't try to take general relativity equations and shove that in our neurons either. So I don't know. I, I, I really, um, uh, I really, um, get the hairs raised in the back of my neck. I really get a little ticked off when I see professors kind of thinking they're, they found like a niche that nobody, nobody's going to, pick them on because they have like one foot in neuroscience, one foot in quantum. And a lot of the neuroscientists don't know the other and, the other and vice versa. And they think they can get away with it. But I, I've never seen anything that's that robust or good. It kind of all seems like quackery to me, but um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, if, if, if there's a, if you have a worldview and quantum physics helps you think that we're all quantumly connected or something, then, God bless. Um, is this uh, in the AMA? Yeah, I can't even keep track of something in this AMA anymore. I, I don't. I need to figure out how to pin comments or something. I, I don't know, but screw it. Uh, I've done. I've done many things sloppily. We'll do this one sloppily too. Um, I get car sick right away if I attempt to play a video game or watch an extremely fast-paced movie. Could you shed any light what's happening or what, if anything, I could do? Uh, yeah, actually, um, a I kind of get this too. Uh, I can't play like a lot of 3D games, like not even VR, just like fake 3D is, makes me kind of sick. And which is a shame because I really want to play cyberpunk. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try that. Maybe I'll try that this weekend. Um, uh, I keep telling myself, maybe I should, I know that's a huge download, so I should start downloading it. Um, but yeah, there's. So it's more understandable with VR. Let's take the more dramatic example, which definitely makes me nauseated and, and probably just, but, or, or being in a car. So the essential problem is you're getting two sensory inputs. They, 
the brain notices they usually correlate and then they don't. So you have sensors in your inner ear. Uh, it's called vestibular system. And it, it kind of tells you, you know, relation to gravity, you know, how you're situated. You know, if you start falling backwards, there's people who have like vestibular system problems. Um, and it's, it's a really rough thing to have because they, there's nothing physically wrong with them except the sensor in their, in their inner ear near, near their brain. And they just fall right off their feet, you know, even if they're standing or, or walking. Um, so at least you don't have that. But I think that sensor can be pretty sensitive. And I think, you know, we have all, we have all this way to uh, redirect our eyeballs. Um, so uh, let me, let me say this clear. Uh, there's a mismatch between what you're visually processing and your vestibular system. That's the, that's the basic takeaway. And you probably, you might've read this before. Um, and, in th and the one theory is that we, we like evolutionarily developed this nausea on purpose. It's kind of an interesting theory. I don't know if it's true. Um, I like to think this is true when I'm feeling nauseated and feeling like I just have inferior physiology. The explanation is supposedly that um, it made us very sensitive to like poisonous mushrooms uh, because like neuroactive chemicals in substances like mushrooms will, could, you know, say, disrupt the uh, visual system or the, or the vestibular system. So they no longer sync up, they're no longer correlated. Your brain notices that as a very sensitive effect. It's not really having an effect in any other system. It's triggering nausea and you throw it up. And this is like the evolutionary argument. Then you throw up the mushrooms that are starting to um, make your neural system trip in a not fun way. So, um, yeah, I, I think what's happening too is that I think people have different thresholds and sensitivities to motion. And um, I don't know. It justifies my my reason I need to buy a high frequency refresh monitor, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm really sensitive to that stuff. I, I don't know. I just always have been. I've always been. I would be. I would play more games if it wasn't that actually drives me away from playing a lot of games because uh, I get nauseated at the th fake 3D. And um, yeah, there's uh, feelings of disorientation in general happen when there when things when there's two sensory inputs that usually correlate suddenly don't correlate, and in that case of Again, for they claim evolutionary reasons, you have a brainstem reflex that kicks in and makes you actually feel nausea through your vagal nerve, your nerve number ten. Um, is it nerve ten? I, I don't. It's been a while, um, and it, it makes your stomach kind of hyperactive and want to jettison whatever is in it. Um, I'm in quantum mechanics, so, so I was wondering if this is a if there is a basis for that. Yeah, I know quantum mechanics is cool. I told you, I I, I took I took a quantum mechanics class in uh, college. Um, I read it more for fun, um, here and there I've, um, I'm really kind of obsessed with like the underlying, how does the whole universe work kind of question. I think that's one of our best, you know, probes into it. I just don't like when these, uh, academics with their authority shove it together with uh, these really conflated definitions of consciousness and then try to sell that um, poop sandwich to the public, you know? And, and usually they are selling, they're selling books and stuff. And anyway, um, but I know I, I, I really like quantum mechanics. Um, I, physics was like my, my favorite. Um, I probably should have done that. I just, I was, I thought, you know, I should go to med school and whatever. Anyway. Um, I've learned to uh, at say the movie theater to look away from something stationary, like the exit sign every few minutes to stay grounded. Yeah, so there's there's these techniques that uh, like dan uh, dancers and ice skaters use. They call spotting, which you might have heard, because they spin around like crazy. And what they do is they learn to. Let me see if I can do it with the camera. They they like they like have a fixed point and then they have another fixed point. So what they're what they're doing is their body's rotating and when it goes far enough they snap to the other fixed point and their body rotates and they snap. So they're they're trying they they train themselves to do that. Now even that snapping motion is like something you have to get used to because uh, but they're not they're not just having their heads fixed and just having the world whirl. 
um, buy them because um, they would they would they would throw up. So if you ever watch a dancer ice skater spin, they they do that spotting thing because they're trying to lock in on fixed stationary objects. Um, fighter pilots, uh, race car drivers do this too. They learn to never look out the side window because 200, 400 miles per hour in the air versus looking at the horizon. Fixed points are good. Looking sideways is starts your whole brainstem system starts screaming <laughs> like are we falling what's going on um so yeah it, it's it's that when you see when your visual system is completely dominated by motion and your vestibular system doesn't feel there's like there's any acceleration uh that's a mismatch and your brain starts to assume there's something wrong with your sensors and maybe because you've ingested something and then you get nauseated that's the theory i like the theory kind of it's neat there's probably more to it it's probably more complicated but um yeah, spotting is good. Uh, cracking open the windows if you're in the car. Um, I'm around people like that who get car sick too. Um, thanks for addressing this. Hey, no problem. I'm glad. I'm glad I could handle that one. That one was that one was easy for me. Uh, hey, I saw the AMA Space Football King. What a name! All right, let's see. Uh, as a BME junior who really should be studying for a signals final. Oh my God, signals, dude. Good for you, man. I don't know if you were here for this earlier, but uh, when I, my first year at Berkeley, I took a graduate signals class. I never taken a signals class before. I didn't know what a delta function was. I never, I didn't know what a Fourier transform was. That was rough. Anyway, I really like signals now, but I mean, not, well, to a limited extent, but man, learning signals puts you in a, puts you in a cool group. So good, good on you. And I understand not studying. I was the master of not studying. Um, I'm kind of negative about job prospects in the field. Hey, man, those are probably realistic. And it's not just your field. I kind of feel like BME is a really generalized major, and it's hard to be hired for anything that's not specifically BME related. Yeah, I feel that. Has your experience been any different, and do you have any advice for a career? Hopeful. I love the positive word at the end. <laughs> Um, hopeful, a, uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah, better than being a career cynic. Uh, no, that's, this is a big issue for the generation and I assume I'm older than you, but I feel you cause you know, I was in, I got, a, I did all the school I was in my late twenties and then I finally was like, I can't do, cause I did a postdoc too. I wasn't making any money because grad school pays a really okay stipend, but, um, and uh, I'm telling you, I applied to hundreds of jobs and I've done this multiple times since then too. And I don't know, I, I, I went to school with a bunch of people at Berkeley. They all have Berkeley PhDs in engineering. Some of them took a year to find a job um, a lot of them outside their field. Um, I know you're, I'm just, I'm, I'm reaffirming that you should be feeling negative and then I'm going to say something hopeful, hopefully that's, that's, I, I don't have a plan exactly, but that's my, that's my rough, um, imagined plan. Um, I don't have the details fleshed out yet, but I'm just trying to tell you that you ain't crazy and yeah, it's the job market is not appreciated at all in this country, um, politically or in the mainstream. I mean, I don't know what aggregate numbers they're talking about, but there are so many people I know who are in their mid twenties. I mean, there used to be a stat, I, I like something like almost like half or some hideous number of uh, 25, 26 year olds were like living at home with their parents that had graduated college. Some, some double digit percentage is it's hideous. Um, at least you got engineering because I know there's people trying to do this with English majors, uh, soft social sciences, soft sciences. Sciences is kind of bullshit. I remember I did a biochem degree and if I didn't get in med school, I was like, what am I going to do? Be a biochem tech in a lab for like 18 K a year. I mean, if, you know, and I would probably have to move states to find a job. I, I, I don't know. Um, so 
this is my attempt to uh, uh, swing it back. Um, so I would say feel positive about your your engineering. Um, I assume you don't want to do more school. I usually don't recommend more school. I'm kind of I'm kind of jaded on school, but you know, it's a good option if you don't know what you're doing or you can't find a job. Um, uh, if there's something you're really interested, if you if you just want to get out in the real world and get a job, make money, and interact with like a normal adult, and not be in a sheltered bubble like grad school, I totally feel that. I I think that's way more commendable. Um, It's hard to not be hired for anything that's not specifically BME related. So BME is weird because BME is super broad. And I remember a lot of my friends uh, I was in Berkeley with uh, or had BME backgrounds because we were in a biomedical engineering back. I, I didn't, I had a bio, I was, you know, I mean, um, and they always felt like uh, an inferiority complex compared to like mechanical or electrical, like these so-called, they're more harder to find disciplines. Um, they're just more specific. Um, but the advantage is there are a broad, I mean, people work in medical imaging, people work in biotech, which is more biological stuff. Um, yeah, school is not worth it if you're totally doing it for the sake of staying in school. Absolutely, absolutely. It's just a terrible, it's not good for you mentally. It's not good. Problem is I understand people who are like, I'm applying to a bunch of jobs in the meantime, maybe I can get a degree or something. I don't know what else to do. Um, maybe it's competitive out there. I, I don't. I don't know. But yeah, if you're just kind of doing it thoughtlessly, that's like the worst thing to do. Um, totally agreed. Um, I'm just. I'm just trying to tell you, man, that um, yeah, I, I literally had this experience with <laughs> graduate level BMEs in uh, Berkeley, and. Um, let, let me tell you some of my friends, what they ended up with. Uh, a few of them ended up in consulting, like really general consulting. And this is another reason I would say like avoid school because some of these guys I know, they did six, seven, eight years, uh, PhD. And I knew, I knew some really smart guys too. And, and no, nobody seemed to get out in under like six years. It was, it's really horrible. And then in six years, like some of my friends that I left in undergrad, with undergrad degrees, you know, that just went into school, you know, they, they got pretty far along in their career paths. Um, and then my friends, on, on the other hand, they were at Berkeley rather, they, um, you know, they, I mean, maybe they start at 10K more, but um, you gotta, you gotta be, I know you're not talking about grad school. I'm just, I'm just talking about other options so that you feel better about whatever you're doing. <laughs> it's part of my plan. It's part of my, um, this is the school therapy channel now. Um, I wonder, I wonder how popular that would be. Anyway, um, yeah, no, I, I, I totally feel you, man. Uh, BME, yeah, and then on top of it, yeah, because a lot of these job descriptions, they'll say BME, and then you click on it, and it's like they'll get they'll get specific skills, like oh, you have experience programming a Siemens MRI or a GE MRI scanner, or do you have an experience um, working with like some specific pharmaceutical um, lab equipment or something like that. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess if you're not, I, I guess the issue is, I, I was always interested in some specific domain, but maybe you're not interested in a specific domain. And I'm not sure that's, that's a problem because I, I don't think what I did was super efficient or good. Um, if you're okay with, uh, you, I guess you, I guess I would re recommend like you identify what you, what's important to you. Like maybe, maybe it's more important that you just get a job and be an adult and you don't really care. Like it's like, it's still on your list, but it's a little lower. Um, maybe there is a specific domain you want to work. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what your priority list is, but you know, whatever your priority is, then everything else might have to adapt. You know, you might have to apply wide and geographically. You might, um, yeah, a lot of my friends too. Again, I, I knew some really smart guys. Uh, you know, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of times they end up with one job. They do lots of, I, you, you get all these people. I, I'm not super familiar with Red Edit, but I've 
seen a little bit. These people, like broadcasting, they got like seven interviews and seven offers, and that's that's not what I've heard. And I I have some pretty good degrees, and I have not experienced that at all. I have had a hell of a time every time I want to transition. Um, it takes months. I'm just I'm shooting dozens of apps out. Um, I'm customizing resumes to different people, you know, and I get some single digit percentage callbacks, and then I, out of that, I get even sing, single digits of of interviews and then it's it's the way it is i think this is why people don't switch jobs very often and i, I just kind of had a perception that the job market was more fluid uh because i think they like to present that so um the good news is you only have to figure it out once uh and then you can once you get bored of your job you can spend months or years trying to figure it out again uh while you hold that job but um yeah um yeah, the problem is I only, I only knew a bunch of BME guys that went to grad school because uh, I met them all in grad school. Um, yeah, and then in, in, in undergrad, I knew a bunch of CE guys, computer engineering guys. That's kind of what was around me a lot. And uh, some went to work in defense companies. Uh, I don't know. I guess I would just keep casting your mind. There's probably industries you're not thinking about. I'm constantly finding new industries. And, you know, I don't know. I think that's what I would be preoccupied with. You. I understand, I mean, more than your signal funnel. Um, yeah. Anyway, I know, you probably gotta, I don't, what, what, what level of signals is, is a junior, you guys doing a, like convolution, DRock deltas? I, I don't, I don't even remember what the, Do you think uh, games can really change the brain or possibly used to prevent brain disease or combat it? It's a, it's a thick, thorny ass question. Uh, it's a good question. Um, again, I think like most things, I'm reacting to the perception out there or the hype. So in general, no. Uh, I think there's a lot of claims that you kind of have to be cynical about by default. Um, Um, signals and systems, so Fourier transformation stuff. Okay, cool. Thanks so much for the input. Oh, no, thank you, man. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting to hear. It's still the same. <laughs> still like that. Uh, yeah, I wish you best of luck, man. I, 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 I know this rough, stuff's rough and, um, I don't know. I was never a great student. I kind of stumbled forward and figured it out. And sometimes I had gaps, you know, so, um, I don't know. People like to present a much more smoother exterior appearance than how things are. So I keep that in mind. Um, uh, games change the brain or can they be used to prevent brain disease or combat it? Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I was, so. The, I guess, I guess like the, the comparative I would use is to what extent do you think like walking every day or eating healthy can can prevent disease? Because these all things are like statistical, you know. Um, you know, no, nothing's like a hard vaccine, and even vaccines aren't one hundred percent. And and uh, and so all these like behaviors and you know, so like weirdly like getting educated and working a job is actually protective against dementia, and. Is it really protective against dementia or does it shift it back like five years? There's debate in the literature about that. It looks like it might shift it back. <clears throat> shift it back. Um, there might be some, <clears throat> sorry, give me a second. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so it's a good question because, you, I mean, one thing, one way to think about this stuff is, you know, could I be doing other things that are better and more efficient? Um, but it also comes down to like what you enjoy. Um, so I think some of this whole brain training stuff um, is to combat a lot of the negative <clears throat> press that uh, games had. You know, if you're, I, 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 had a, I had a grandmother who actually liked playing the Nintendo NES and she never 
had been exposed to games in her whole life. And when she was like in her 60s, she liked playing this stuff. And I think like the medical establishment back then would have been like, I don't know, it's bad for you. Back in the, you know, whatever, 90s or whatever, it's it, it's going to cause her to be massively violent, go on a shooting spree or something crazy. I mean, it was, it's, it's always these reactionary pressures, but... Um, To some extent, like like if you're if you don't have good options, you don't, you're mobilized, and there's games on your phone that you can download, and it can keep you engaged. It's interactive. It's a little more interactive than Netflix. It's probably better. I mean, go ahead and watch Netflix. We may also get a, some games in there. But if it's like you could be walking around the block instead, you could be a little more active. I would I would really you know if, if you were like friend of mine or, or something I, I'd really rather see you do that um, but I, I don't know if it's a it's a, a severe trade-off like that maybe you could do both you know it, it's just if you enjoy it um, I guess do it mindfully knowing that there's some positives um, in terms of like preventing brain disease like it's a medical technology no I don't think so I don't I don't I don't think so it's like it's like supplements you know like maybe you get a little, you know, some single di digit percentage boost from uh, doing uh, fish oils or something, but, but, um, uh, or whatever the supplements you're taking. Um, uh, but, you know, and it's not all about uh, disease too. It's about quality of life. I mean, that's a big thing, especially you learn this in medicine. Um, I mean, if you're making yourself miserable, it's funny, I, I don't know if this study is even valid anymore, but I remember learning this a long time ago when I was young. They had the, a bunch of guys do the Mediterranean diet and, um, or a bunch of Mediterranean guys. I don't know. I don't remember what it was. They, they, they basically took a bunch of old guys and they switched them onto a so-called healthy diet, whatever was trendy back then. And it was this large study and the mortality actually went up on the healthy diet. And to some extent, you know, it might've been like the stress of them, um, Switching to something they didn't enjoy, switching to something they weren't adapted to. Maybe maybe they could have done the switch easier. Maybe the, the, the protocol wasn't good. Um, maybe this is all just a ra rationalization that we should all just do whatever we want and enjoy ourselves. But, um, yeah, I'm just saying quality of life is important. And, uh, and I don't know. If you're talking to people, you're engaged. If you don't have people to talk to, that's rough. So maybe you can... You can do things like this through the internet. I mean, this is good for me because I'm, I'm not very social a lot of times. Um, you know, is talking in person better? Maybe there's probably better things psychologically for that. But uh, this is better than being completely isolated. Is is like doing a crossword better than ga playing games? I, I don't I don't know. You know, so um, I don't know. Um, but but is it a hard prevent a brain disease? Uh, no. Uh, but does engaging, being physically active, being mentally engaged, does that make you more resilient to things that might suddenly hit you? Like, for instance, there's an interesting study recently where they uh, took a bunch of people um, with major surgery out of anesthesia, uh, who had general anesthesiology, and when they woke up and they recovered, some people have this um, effect of, like, um, I forget what it's called. It's like it's almost like a post-operative. Um, it's not dementia, delirium. And the, the drugs just hit them really hard and they don't recover that well. And in some cases, maybe they had some like um, brain disease that wasn't that prevalent and the, the shock of that, of being knocked out with drugs and being operated on, uh, sort of pushed them over the edge. But in general, people were more active and engaged, um, even mentally or even with video games that the study was showing are, uh, did better. So that was like a protocol and they ran this in the Midwest somewhere where they had people play video games and uh, they had like less post-operative delirium. And I think just, you know, it's kind of like uh, warming up the brain engine every day and however you want to do that. And if you can push it and challenge it, that's good. Um, let's keep going. Uh, pretty fluid in software engineering, hell, even mechanical engineering. Oh yeah, we were talking about that stuff. Um, does physical exercise benefit brain activity in an incremental way, looking past blood circulation and more into plasticity? Yeah, it's, that's a really good distinction. Uh, I think people love saying the first part of what you just said, 
uh, because they're implying the second part. So that was a great breakdown. Um, yeah, because physical exercise, physical exercise actually helps a lot of things. I mean, in theory, it could even help um, diabetes because diabetes is a problem where with um, such high uncontrolled glucose levels that you're just getting sort of um, um, very indiscriminate glycos uh, glycosylation and uh, oxidation of of cells and it starts to destroy your like the most micro vessels like capillaries and then people over time you know they get like gangrene foots and I, I used to do this in some op um, rotations I did where we had to amputate uh, you know, famously people with diabetes will lose like their lower feet and stuff like that, or sometimes their legs. Um, and it's really the destruction of the microvascular system. And so exercise is like something that like has the opposite effect. It causes your blood pressure to kind of go up in a healthy way. It stretches all your blood vessels. You, it stimulates blood vessel growth or repair. Um, it causes all the interstitial fluid to kind of circle through your, your, um, your tissues and cells. Um, and this all works at the brain level too. Um, it's a little bit of a protected system through uh, the dura mater. Um, it's, you know, there's the blood brain barrier, but blood pressure um, transmits through into the brain, uh, changes in your body, transmits into your brain. Um, there's interstitial fluid in your brain. Um, so it's, a lot of this works too. So yeah, so this person, so, so then uh, ASAP, is, is asking the next level question, uh, looking past all that um, into plasticity. Uh, yes, there's evidence of this. Um, because so much of your brain is just dedicated to controlling your body and all of the muscles that control your body. The, um, so if you're not aware, this whole strip here on the top is you have your PMA and your, and your motor cortex um, in between your your vision and parietal and before your prefrontal there's a whole command center for all your motor and there's a motor planning center next to that um, which is uh, kind of cool um, that's all getting activated so that i think just exercise it's weird it's another way to think about it it's like cognitive exercise is cognitive training so if you do uh complex things um which is sort of an argument against video gaming because you're only you're only doing the 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 clicking with your, you know, one finger and a, your fingers in your hands. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so full body exercise, even walking. I don't know. That's, that's all, that's all at, at the very least you're working out like 20% of your brain. Uh, if you do full body exercise because you're causing all that area to do motor planning and to activate your muscles and things like that. Um, is there more be and then and then on top of it you're probably recruiting parietal centers which gives you so if you knock out your parietal centers which is more further downstream your brain from your pre-motor planning um like people who have strokes in the, those some of these areas um lose their sense of their surrounding environments and sense of their own body so like somatic sensation or like if you're in a neurology ward and people have strokes there you can present them present them their own arm and they they think it's not their arm it's kind of crazy um so the, so the whole parietal areas too are being recruited or used probably when you move your body because you're trying not to run into anything in your environment and you're aware of everything um anyway my point is at the very least you're actually using exercise in your brain when you when you move your bodies and in a more in comprehensive ways um yeah, you get carpal tunnel instead of dementia with video games. That's right. That's right. That's why we need the fully immersive kinesthetic glove. Those those omni treadmill systems, if you've seen them. Um, we need that full body VR experience uh, for the sake of our wrists and dementia. Um, yeah. Oh no, thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. I mean, I would say take a dip out of both, you know, play your video games and then go go for a walk. But um, yeah, it's been super fun. Um, at the very least, I'm gonna 
I'm gonna throw in a. Um, oh, there's, there's still a few people here. That's very cool. Um, like I said before, I'm I'm probably gonna stream again tomorrow. I don't know. It's fun. It's cool. I'm trying to stay hip. Uh, yeah. Uh, I might come back, but I might just be more brain dead, and I might just be playing some games. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'll still respond to chat. I'll try to. I feel like I'm losing my voice a little bit, but um, I really appreciate the questions. Uh, really, really positive energy here. It's really kind of nice. Uh, I'm gonna th I'm gonna use all my skills in Ob Studio to throw on an interlude screen and go take a quick break for a couple minutes, or not. I'm just gonna do this. <laughs> oh, all right. Let's just do this. Thanks guys though, I uh, appreciate it. It's cool hearing what everybody was interested in too. That's That's been really informative for me. Um, 48, uh, thanks. BRB and a few. Boom. High Tech Ob Studio. All right, thanks, guys.